Round number two of univariate plotting. So last time we talked about numeric variables, interval or ratio. Today we's going to talk about categorical variables, which are nominal or ordinal variables. But what's the point? Why, whatever do you mean? What's the point of plotting univariate distributions of categorical variables? Slow down, brother. Answer your question right now. Anytime we plot data, we need to make sure we have data integrity. That means that we need to make sure that the numbers represent what we think they're representing. But sometimes that don't happen. For example, there was recently a study published that said that girls self-regulate better than boys. Problem was there was a data coding error and they accidentally flipped the coding for girls and boys. And so they had to retract it, embarrassingly, and later say, oh, just kidding, actually boys regulate better than girls. Oops. So that's why this matters. That's why, that's, that's, why, that's, that's why it matters to plot the univariate distributions. Because if you never visualize it, you don't know if there's something funky going on. And what sorts of funky things can we expect? Great question. But first, let's look at an example plot where nothing wonky is going on. Oh, just kidding. There is something wonky going on. And what is that wonky thing you ask? Look at the number of people who want to be statisticians. That can't be right. Everybody wants to be a statistician, am I right? So just like a histogram, Y axis shows the quantity and the X axis shows the different values of X. But in this case, the different values are categorical. The spaces are there to remind you that these are categorical variables, not numeric variables. So this best profession graph, according to a prestigious poll, asks people what they want to be and they give them four options. Fireman, pilot, accountant, or statistician. The most people in the sample reported they wanted to be a fireman with, I don't know, 175 or so. Then pilot, then accountant, then statistician. We statisticians, we have it so bad. So that's an example where nothing funky is going on. The data behave as you would expect. You wouldn't think, honestly, that that many people would choose to be a statistician. We're a funky bunch. You wanna know the difference between an accountant and a statistician? Statisticians are people who didn't have enough personality to be accountants. So here are the different things we can look out for. One, missing data. So in this example, we have a treatment group and a control group and NA. Uh oh what does NA mean? That is many statistical programs native way of conveying that that information is missing. So in this graph, we have, it looks like two or three or four, uh, let's see, two or three or four people missing. And that could be problematic. If you wanna know why, check out my missing data video in the description below. What else are we looking for? Good question. How about redundant labels? So in this graph, we see females, males, and men. We've got both males and men. There's so much testosterone, I can't handle it. So what happened here? What happened was that somebody accidentally used two different labels to either be men or male, same thing. And if you were to blindly analyze these data, the results that you report might be entirely meaningless. So watch out for redundant labels. How about unknown groups? Why, whatever do you mean, good sir? Thank you for asking. That means we have a situation here where we have a treatment and a control group. That makes sense. And then we have another category label called PX5 pound 77. What the flip does that mean? I have no idea. Do you? Nope. And that's the problem. Sometimes wonky things like that happen and you get a group that doesn't exist. So what do you do? Well, that requires some further exploration. Next problem, too few people in one group. So in this example, we have drug users and we have, oh, I don't know, almost, let's see, 48 people-ish. And then we have non-drug users, which looks to be about one person. And then of course we have missing data. Okay, that's problematic. Why? Because let's say this person wanted to do a t-test or something like that. We'll talk about that later. They want to do some sort of analysis and they want to make inferences about drug users versus non-drug users. Do you see a problem with that? Heck yeah! You're trying to make inferences based on two people? Are you kidding me? Uh-uh. That ain't gonna happen. So that's something you look out for. If you look at a bar graph and you see there are too few people in one group, that's a problem. And then we have role reversals. So in this situation, we have a bunch of combat veterans that we have sampled. And by golly, lo and behold, what do we see but that females, there are almost 500 of them 
and males, there's like 20 of them. Do you see a problem here? Up until recently, females weren't even allowed in combat. And you think things changed that quickly? That now there are that many more females than males? I don't think so. Neither do I. So obviously this is a situation where somebody had messed up the coding. They accidentally called females males and males females. Because here's what happens. Sometimes when you read a data set into some program like SPSS, it takes the names that you had, male and female, and converts them to a one or a zero. And then along the way, there's some sort of translation that happens. You forget which one is one, which one is zero, and then you mislabel them, and then you're screwed. So watch out for that. Make sure you look at the univariate distributions and make sure that they match what you think the data set should look like. Got it? Oh, this next one's a fun one. Mixed up labels. So in here, we have a bunch of 14-year-old youth being asked how many sexual partners they have had in their lifetime. Oh my goodness! The mode here, which you will remember means the most frequently occurring score, is 10 plus. So most people are answering they've had 10 or more sexual partners? Really? They're 14 years old! What has the world come to? And the number of people who have had zero partners is like one? Nuh-uh. So something probably happened here where somebody flipped the codes and the 10 plus should probably be zero and the zero should be something else. Basically, this tells you you need to look at your data a little more closely and make sure that the labels you are using actually match what the participants reported. Enough said. So in summary, what are we looking for? Missing data. Too many labels like male and men. Unknown labels like P, X, Q, star, seven, seven, or something that you don't recognize. Large imbalances in the groups. Role reversals, where you accidentally flip male and female, or treatment and control, or something like that. And then finally, we have mislabeling of categories, where everything just messed up. Most of the adolescents have 10 plus sexual partners. Uh-uh. Now you tell me. Why is this important? Because eventually we're going to try to attach meaning to the analysis that we perform. And if our analysis has mixed up the labels, then we're going to interpret things incorrectly. And that's just a problem. So with that, let's review our learning objectives. Number one, identify problems from categorical univariate distributions. Number two, understand what the following terms mean. Missing data, too many labels, unknown labels, large imbalances of groups, role reversals, and mislabeling of categories. And make sure you know how to identify each of those. Number three, understand what a bar chart is. Number 77, understand the difference between a histogram and a bar chart. Number 70Z, understand the difference between a histogram and a bar chart. Did I already say that one? And learning objective number 100, know that you are awesome. Peace out.